Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And we're going to continue this study dealing with the symbolic use of numbers, the history of it in our movement. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do and for the Sabbath, for the message this morning and last night. And um, we know, Lord, that there is a work that needs to be done upon our hearts. Um, that we remain unconverted, that there's so much that needs to be done and that we are not fitted for that work. And so we just ask, Lord, that as we continue to study your word, uh, that the truths that you have unfolded to us uh, can strengthen us, that they can um, affect a change in our lives, that we can uh, truly represent Christ upon this earth. I pray for each person studying and we ask for your Holy Spirit's presence um, to instruct us as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. So um, this study on the symbolic use of numbers, as, as I've stated before, is <clears throat> looking at how things were unfolded to this movement progressively regarding uh, chronology and also the use of these symbolic dates. And um, last time we went through a little bit of this and how we came to understand this line here in 2016, uh, dealing with the date. So on the top, you see, of course, April 19th, uh, July 21st, Boston. And that's actually, there is a paper I wrote on um, the midnight cry where I address that often the uh, like hieromets in riding up on the horse, that that's uh, misplaced as being at Exeter. That's actually at Boston that that occurs. Um, so, and that's just simply because um, uh, Loughborough, when he writes of that history, he actually doesn't realize that um that Exeter was in August. He thought Exeter was in July. And so he, when he was gathering information about the giving of the midnight cry, he, he just basically married the two events together. And it took this movement time uh, to understand that we had this uh, Boston date. So back in 2013 on August 31st, uh, Jeff had asked a question at the camp meeting in Alberta uh, regarding the first day of the first month. And I'd done a rough calculation at that time, did a little paper, uh, but didn't share it with anyone. I just did it for my, my own sake and came to recognize uh, what happened on August 15th, the first day of the first month. And, um, and then later you're going to have, uh, um, you're going to have Noel present that at um, the camp meeting in the summer, uh, the one that starts on June uh, 22nd in 2014. He's going to present um, the first day of the fifth month. And then it's going to be later. Um, uh, so by the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016, that we start looking at this way mark called Midnight. So it's not going to be till 2016 that we have this line. And it's going to be at that time that I'm studying the chronology of Ezekiel. And, and we see, dealt with some of that last week. Now, um, and, I, and I did make reference to this chart here, though I've added a few things to it. So in Ezekiel, when we look at the reason why our attention was drawn to Ezekiel, in 2016 was because of the first or the fifth day of the fourth month. That is when Ezekiel is going to begin prophesying. That's in Ezekiel chapter one, verses one and two. It's in the 30th year, um, which would be the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle. And it's going to be in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And that's counted as Jehoiachin's reign would have been counted. It's, it's a fall to fall count. And it's going to be the fifth day 
of Tammuz, or the fifth day of the fourth month, as it's stated in Ezekiel. And in 1844, the fifth day of the fourth month is July 21st. It's exactly midway between April 19th and October 22nd. So it's the center of a chiasm. And Ezekiel, is, the last date in his book, is going to be uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, month in Ezekiel 40, verse 1. And in, in both of these dates, on the Julian calendar in 592 and 573, respectively, for the July 21st and October 22nd, they're going to be, those Julian dates are going to line up with the Gregorian dates in 1844. And um, so that's something that's extremely unlikely, that if we were uh, to have, you know, Ezekiel has uh, 13 dates. There's 14. I mean, you could even add more if you look at hidden dates, um, because he does refer to on the first day of the fifth month about Jerusalem being broken. That would be on the ninth day of the fourth month. But that date isn't given in the book of Ezekiel. So there's 13 given dates, biblical dates. Um, and uh, we also find, though, that in Ezekiel 29, verse 17, it mentions the first day of the first month. That's going to be in a prophecy uh, regarding Egypt. So we're going to we're going to look at these these dates here. And um, I, I want to take my time just to to have you really understand what what is being shown here by Ezekiel. So we, we talked about Ezekiel in the previous study that uh, Dwight was doing. Right. So Ellen White's talking about Ezekiel nine and that we need to to look at this. And she mentions it in context of Zechariah chapter five. Now, the book of Ezekiel, um, as a child reading uh, the Bible. I just found it fascinating, especially Ezekiel chapter eight. Um, for some reason, it was just very visual in my mind when, you know, Ezekiel, you know, goes and looks through the hole in the wall and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was always fascinated by Ezekiel, but I had no understanding of Ezekiel. And, and maybe that's partly why it fascinated me so much. It was so it was such a vivid book. Um you know, just vivid descriptions, obviously the wheels within wheels and all these mysterious things that were really hard to conceptualize and to visualize. Um, so for, for my mind, anyway, it was fascinating, a fascinating book. But I really had no understanding of Ezekiel. Now, I did study Ezekiel in university as part of the course I took on um, um, the prophets, I took a course on, on the major prophets uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Um, but I don't think I still had much of an understanding of Ezekiel. And part of it was I didn't have an understanding of the chronology. And, and it was really this that opened up the book of Ezekiel to me personally. And, and this is going to happen in 2016, right? Because of the fifth day of the fourth month. So we're, we, we look at that date, we see it as the symbol in Millerite history. And then I start working through, I've already been working through the Babylonian captivity, but now my attention is drawn to Ezekiel. And as I look at Ezekiel, uh, I start to notice these, these dates. So uh, we're, we're going to look at them. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through each of these dates uh, as they're presented in the Bible. Um, so uh, I'm going to have to switch to the Bible. And, and the first one is Ezekiel 29, verse 17. Now, this date here, as, as you will see, uh, it says it came to pass in the 7 and 20th year, in the first month on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Now, it's the 7 and 20th year of what? Anybody know? Why, why is he saying the 7 and 20th year? If we go back to the beginning of this chapter, it says here in the 10th year, in the 10th month, in the 12th day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Now, here in the 10th year, this is the 10th year of what? 10th year, the 10th month, the 12th day of the month. 
Isn't that from the siege of Jerusalem? No, that would be the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year. Okay. <clears throat> right? So that, that's going to be in Ezekiel 24. In the ninth year, the 10th month, the 10th day of the month. Um, so remember, it, when you go through Ezekiel, he's going to have these series of visions, and each of the visions are going to be dated. And that means everything that happens under a date, everything that's stated, that is given on that date. Right. So, you know, he's going to have his first vision in Ezekiel one, verse one. And then everything that he has that, that is, includes Ezekiel chapter four, those are all given on that date. Now, he's um, there's a confusing thing in Ezekiel chapter one where he's he's carried off in vision and sits astonied for 12 for for um, seven days. And, and that he doesn't actually do. Can't remember which verse this is. It must be. It's actually Ezekiel three. That's in Ezekiel three. Okay, in Ezekiel three. That's why I can't find it. Um, yeah. So in Ezekiel three, he's going to be carried off into vision, and he's going to in verse fifteen. Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv. That's not Tel Aviv in Jerusalem. That's Tel Aviv in in Babylon. That dwelt by the river Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. So um, this is in vision that this occurs, right? It says in verse 14, so the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So some people take that as if this actually happens, but if you compare it with other places where he's lifted up, this is actually in vision. And so he doesn't literally sit there for seven days. Um, and then it's going to say it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So some people say, well, that must be a literal seven days, uh, but it's not. It's just a symbol uh, that happens. It's 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 um, symbolic and it's it's uh, in vision that that happens. And then in chapter eight, which is connected to chapter nine, it's going to be in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month. So. This is going to be one year later, and um, and it's going to be in the sixth month. So his first vision is in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, and, and it's the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So this one gives us this, this year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And, and Jehoiachin's captivity is going to be counted fall to fall. Um, in this context, in Ezekiel counts it as if Jehoiachin was actually reigning. And um, um, and then we know that Ezekiel was taken captive also at that time. Right. So he's going to be he's going to be one of the captives that was carried away captive when Jehoiachin was taken captive. And, and then this 30th year, as we saw last time, is the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle. So you have that vision. You have chapter eight, the sixth year, uh, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month. Now, in this one, he's actually is going to do something um, in the nighttime that's going to, this vision ends up on the sixth day of the sixth year of the sixth month. So it has that symbol of 666. Um, uh, and then, of course, we have Ezekiel chapter nine. And then the next, the, the third vision is going to be Ezekiel 20. So in Ezekiel 20, this is in the seventh year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Now, it doesn't say the seventh year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Neither did chapter 8. Um, and if you look at the Jewish calendar, they can start the year either in the spring or in the fall. Now, Jehoiachin's captivity uh, is going to be counted fall to fall. And and this year would be just the seventh year, the fifth month. So if you're in the fourth month, the fifth month, the sixth month, it doesn't really matter whether it's a fall to fall or a spring to spring count. It would still give you the same year. But um, it, it does matter if it's from uh, the seventh month to the 12th or 13th month, if there is one, uh, that you know whether it's a spring to spring or a fall to fall count. So normally when we are given a 
in the year of the captivity, it's going to be, um, it's going to be given for a reason. That is, we need to be able to discern that we actually have a fall to fall count. And, and I know this is a little bit technical and a little bit complicated for people. So I'm going to try to just, you know, take my time with it. Uh, but here it doesn't matter because it's in the fifth month and the same with chapter eight. But the first one mentions it's in the captivity because he wants to make it clear that sometimes he's counting a fall to fall count. Sometimes, most of the times it's, well, I shouldn't say most, lots of times it's a spring to spring count. And that would be Zedekiah's reign. So here when it says it came to pass in, pass in the seventh year, that would be in the seventh year of, Je, of not of Jehoiachin's captivity, but in the seventh year of Zedekiah's reign. He doesn't explicitly state that. He assumes that you will assume that. Okay. In uh, chapter 8. Yeah. With the date that's given there, Ellen White specifically says it's the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign. Okay, good. Yeah, so it is the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign, not the sixth year. Well, it would, wouldn't matter. If, it, if you said it was the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, it would still be the same date because it is in the sixth month. So it wouldn't really matter. But she says it's in the sixth year of Zedekiah's reign. Yeah. Thanks for that. So so this would be the same thing when it just says the seventh year. We said, well, it's the seventh year of uh, Zedekiah's reign. OK, and then in verse 20 or chapter 24, we're going to get uh, the ninth year. In the 10th month, in the 10th day of the month, and this would also be Zedekiah's reign. This would not be in Jehoiachin's captivity. So here it matters to know that this is a spring to spring calendar. If you believed it was a fall to fall calendar, you would actually move this one year earlier. So you would have had the siege. If you believe that all of Ezekiel was fall to fall, you would have has to, had to place the siege not in 587, uh, but in 588. And you would have had a siege that goes on for two and a half years. Because if, um, let me think here. No, that's not right. Um, I know some people put it as a two and a half year siege. And I'm trying to figure, oh, yeah, because um, even I get confused when I think about this. So if you think that this was a fall to fall calendar, right, you would move this ninth year. In the 10th month here, I'm going to try to show this. I'll show this illustration. I don't know where I put this diagram, so it might take a bit to find it. Um, so this is going to have to go back here when I worked on Ezekiel. I'll, once I find the diagram, I'll show it to you. I mean, I did show it to you last time. I just can't remember the slide number. Okay. <clears throat> So I should have one of these. Okay. So that's the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, this would be a spring to spring calendar. So you're going to see, um, I don't know why that's lined up that way. So you're going to see that if you go from the ninth year to the 11th year, it's just simply going to be a year and a half, roughly, right? Okay. And I think I have one where I show uh, here. Um, that's not the right one. Maybe I deleted it. Okay. Ah, this would be it. So, uh, so you can see this hopefully quite clearly. So, if we had a fall-to-fall -fall calendar, and we were counting. Zedekiah's reign fall to fall. You would see that the siege would have begun in the 10th month of the ninth year. So notice when the Jews count the months, they always begin in the spring. And so if, if a rain was fall to fall, the ninth year would begin in the fall. And so the 10th day of the 10th month would be in the fall, right? And that means it would be near the beginning of the ninth year. 
And so on the top, you see ninth year, 10th year, 11th year. So if the siege is going to end, and it looks like the arrow is in the wrong spot, but it's going to end on the, the ninth day of the fourth month in the 11th year. So move it over here more. You're going to see that that's going to be two years and a half, right? Is that, you see that clearly? Um, so in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Sabbath school lesson back in, um, trying to think which year it was, um, they, they did one on uh, Ezekiel. Anyway, what they're going to do is they're going to say that the siege begins uh, in 588 and ends in 586. And so it's going to at, begin at the beginning in January of 588, and it's going to end um, in July of 586. So that's two and a half years. But the siege is only a year and a half, not two and a half. Okay, so you can see there's a difference. If if I understand Ezekiel as either being every date is spring to spring or every date is being fall to fall, I'm going to end up with all kinds of contradictions in the book of Ezekiel. So I'm not going to go through all the details of how I worked that out. But one of the conclusions I came to is that when we're counting the reign of Zedekiah, it's going to be spring to spring. And that's going to make that siege a year and a half. But it will talk about in the year of the captivity. And, and that's going to be a fall to fall count. Now, also, sometimes he talks just about um, a span of time that's an ordinal count. Like in the 14th year from when the city was smitten, uh, he's just counting a normal ordinal count that we would count. Um, so we'll. we'll talk about that later so anyway he's going to have this uh vision here which is the start of the siege and then getting back to chapter 29 we're going to have this prophecy against egypt right and uh, this prophecy against egypt uh it's going to be in the 10th year the 10th month the 12th day of the month so it's 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 in a this this is um so if it's in the 10th year, this is happening during the time that the siege is going on. So Ezekiel is going to be told that he's going to be dumb, that he's not going to be able to speak any prophecies against Israel until uh, the escapee comes and tells him of the destruction of Jerusalem. So in that intervening period, because he's going to talk here about the siege, right, in chapter uh, 24, and then he's going to his wife is going to die. Right. And then he's going to be told that he's dumb. And so then he's going to prophesy in chapter 25 against Ammon, uh, uh, Moab and Edom, Edom, Moab and Ammon. Right. That's uh, uh, from Daniel, chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, where we have that. And then he's going to prophesy against Tyre uh, for two chapters, I believe. Or is it three? Yeah, three chapters. And then in chapter 29, he's going to prophesy against Egypt. And he does this also in chapter 30, where he has a lament for Egypt. And 31 and 32. So that's four chapters, right? And then we're going to get to Ezekiel 33. Okay. So, so he has these different uh, visions. Now in, so going back to 29, this is during the siege that he has this vision. But when you get to, uh, verse, um, 29, verse 17, all of a sudden he's going to write in a vision that he had much later. It says it came to pass in the seven and twentieth year in the first month and the first day of the month. So he's going to mention the first month and the first day of the month that he has this vision. And, and he's going to mention this because he says, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve great service against Tyrus. And every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages nor his army for Tyrus, for the service that he served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. 
and he shall take her multitude and take her spoil and take her prey, and it shall be wages for his army. I've given him the land of Egypt for his labor. Now, so why is this vision that is going to be uh, three years, or I guess two years, depends how you count it, um, but basically it's three years, two and a half years, after Ezekiel chapter 40, because Ezekiel chapter 40 is going to be in the 20 and 50 year of our captivity at Rosh Hashanah in the 10th day of the seventh month, it would be the 14th year after the city was smitten. So this vision in 29 verse 17 is going to be um, two and a half years later. So why is this vision that's two and a half years later after he had the vision in chapter 40? Why is it inserted here in Ezekiel 29? And it's going to be on the first day of the first month. Well, Ezekiel is just compiling all the prophecies of Egypt to one place. Okay, yeah. So he's he's taking these prophecies of Egypt and he's putting them here. So he's not going to put it at the end of the book, uh, but he's going to put it here. And he's going to have this vision, though, two and a half years after the vision in chapter 40. But he puts it here in chapter 29. Now, um, now we also have the first day of the first month. Now, it, do, can we think of any reason why he has this vision on the first day of the first month? It, it, it's a very broad question. Is the first day of the first month si- significant as a symbol? It is, yes. Yeah, we know it's significant. Uh, it, it's in uh, the book of Ezra, right? And, and actually, from Ezra chapter 7 to 10, it's going to start on the first day of the first month and it's going to end on the first day of the first month, right? So that first day of the first month is this symbol. Um, and now it's here relating to Egypt specifically. Um, so why did, and, and I'm asking you to speculate using what you know, uh, why he is going to choose uh, the first day of the first month, why God is going to choose that date to have this prophecy. So, so there's a simple answer to this. We well, have, to, what's that? Yes, Stephen? Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You do, you do yours first. <laughs> uh, what comes to my mind? I don't know, just, but, uh, there was, uh, the first disappointment associated with the first day of the first month in 1844. Yeah. And with the work that was done with Tyre for, Nebuchadnezzar's army. Mm-hmm. Uh, there wasn't any reward for them. So maybe there was like a, a sense of disappointment. Maybe for his army, his wages weren't received for what they've done for Tyre, but they're going to receive it for Egypt. Okay. And, and we also know that, um, that what happens with the Jews returning to the land, now it's going to happen progressively through three decrees. But it is partly related to the end of Babylon, right? And and so Babylon is given to, or or, or that area, the the Mediterranean area around Israel and the land of Palestine and all that, um, and and all the kingdoms around are given to Nebuchadnezzar for seventy years. Are given to Babylon. It doesn't start with Nebuchadnezzar or end with him. But Babylon is given this uh, this area seven years. And and remember, there is also the 70 years, the days of one king, right? Are we familiar with that prophecy? And what happens after the 70 years, the days of one king? Fire will sing as a harlot. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Tyre is going to sing as a harlot, right? So, so I think there's some connection there to that first day of the first month symbol, just dealing with what we see in Ezra chapter uh, seven, uh, verse nine, right? So there's probably that as well. Now, the other thing, of course, is it's given here for us who are examining Millerite history. So we have those four dates in 1844 that we have marked in our line. Uh, so the simple answer, it's just written here for us to recognize, right? Because I mean, Ezekiel has 13 dates. 
there's no reason that he had to have the first day of the first month or the fifth day of the fourth month or the first day of the fifth month or the 10th day of the seventh month. I mean, they could have just been 13 dates that had no relationship to Millerite history. Um, but I believe God wanted to have all of those dates there. Does, does that make sense? It does, so, but how you to make an application then as Noah's to the event? That the first day of the first month here is talking about. Yes. How would you how would you connect that then to the first day of the first first month in 1844? Okay, well, because this history is typifying what's going to happen in Millerite history. Right? All of these dates. What it, what it's trying to tell us is that these dates are symbols. Right? These dates are symbols. They're, they, they're things that obviously that come from the Bible and other places as well, some of them. Right. Obviously, the first day of the first month is going to be the start of the year. And the 10th day of the seventh month in Ezekiel 40 is going to be the start of the year uh, in the fall when it's a jubilee year. Otherwise, here's the first day of the seventh month. But when it's the 10th day of the seventh month, it's a jubilee year. So it's giving us this information. Um, and and then we can connect this to the 70 years. And so that means we can connect it to the periods of 70 years that are going to happen uh, in that that period of 220 years from uh, 677 to 457. And then we're going to have at the end of that in the third decree, we're going to have this first day of the first month as a symbol. So it means we can we can look at these numbers as symbols. This, the simplest thing is that these dates are given to us as symbols. Right. That, that, you know, there would not be a reason to know exactly which date Ezekiel has this vision on. Right. I mean, the, the fact that he's so specific about each of these dates means that we need to pay attention to them so we can connect it to the 70 years. We can connect it to to Ezra. We can connect it to uh our lines, we can connect it to uh, what we found in 2016 with the symbol of uh, of each of these dates. Does that did that did that make sense, Stephen? Um, I was more thinking about what you have here <clears throat> in the first day of the first month is that Egypt is going to be given to Babylon. Yeah. And I'm thinking with the Millerites there in 1844, with the first day of the first month, that the people there are going to, in a sense, be given, those who have rejected that message, in a sense, would they would be, in a sense, would they be given to Babylon, like Egypt? No, they would be like maybe worldly Christians, you know, if, if Egypt was going to be typifying the world. Right. There in a sense going to be given to Babylon, maybe connecting yeah. that sort of symbolism. Yeah, so that's that symbolism is there as well, right? So so we can see that it's not just an arbitrary date, that that there there's reasons for these different dates. Now all, all of them we don't fully understand yet, because he has 13 dates. And and I think there's still probably more to learn from these dates. Now we know that there are some spans of time because when we we put these dates in Ezekiel, um, we had um, a number of different dates that were, um, and I can't remember them all of what happened, but uh, um, yeah, so we'd put them all on a line. It's in my paper on Ezekiel, but I'm trying to find it on here. Okay, here I am. So remember, we had worked out all of these dates and um, it's this calendar, I believe, at the bottom, uh, this chart on the bottom. You're going to have the chronology of Ezekiel's visions, fall to fall captivity, and spring to spring Zedekiah using the Babylonian calendar. So as I studied these things, I tried using the reconstructed biblical calendar, but I found that the Babylonian calendar uh, worked better. Okay, And so we put all of these dates here. And so these are the different visions. You can see um, the first vision here. That's going to be, and I'm going to try to zoom in and 
So can we get any closer? I guess we can't. Okay, so anyway, um, I could probably put this on one page, but so you're gonna see his first vision here, July 21st, 592. That's the third date in from the left. And then his uh, second vision, eight verse one is September 7th, 591. And then his third vision, which is on the 10th day, the fifth month and the seventh year, that's going to be 590. So he's going to 592, 591, 590. And then the siege is going to be in 587 on the 10th day, the 10th month in the ninth year. And then uh, there's the 12th day of the 10th month in the 10th year. That's 29 verse one. But it's it's going to be this vision here way over here in 570. Two and a half years after uh, his vision in Ezekiel 40. That's going to be mentioned in chapter 29, right? So it's going to be the first day of the first month in the 27th year. Now, it doesn't say the 27th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And it doesn't say, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't say that it's in the year of Zedekiah's reign. But is Zedekiah reigning in uh, 570? Uh, he would be long dead, probably. Yeah. So, so the way that I interpret this is once we get to um, these dates that are after the time of Zedekiah, so that is uh, chapter 29, verse 17, uh, chapter uh, 32, verse 1, 32, verse 17, and 33, 21, uh, those dates – which all happen to be in the fall, between the fall and the spring, I actually count them in the year of the captivity, not in the year of Zedekiah's reign, even though they don't explicitly say they're in the year of the captivity. It's just that Zedekiah is no longer reigning. Now, I'm not sure that that's correct, but um, now we had looked at some of the spans here. Do you remember some of the spans between some of these dates? So there was a span between... Uh, was it the siege? Like here, I don't have these spans written out. I have some of them, 19 months, six months, 24 years, 27 years. Uh, but there was a specific number of days. Do you remember what that was, Stephen? Uh, the siege was, I think, uh, 560 days. Two? I mean, the whole siege itself. Yeah. From the siege to the, to the, the walls coming down? Yes. Okay, which is going to be uh, um, uh, the walls are going to come down July 18th, 586. So you're saying that was 860, 560 days. I thought there was some other significant span of time in here. Um, um, you know, well, from Jehoiachin's captivity. Okay, from Jehoiachin's to, captivity. Yeah. Yeah, to uh, Zedekiah's, or oh, sorry, to uh, Ezekiel's first vision. Uh, on the fifth day of the fourth month in the fifth year. Yeah. The natural Gregorian calendar, it's, it's uh, five years, four months and five days. So it oh, matches okay. up the years. fifth year, fourth month, fifth that day. Makes it makes sense. So fifth day of the fourth month of the fifth year. Okay, that's interesting. Five years, four months, and five days. So it, it matches that, even though technically um, – you know, he's not using the Gregorian calendar or Julian calendar, right? No. Uh, but it gives us that number, which is which is pretty bizarre. I mean, because there's no reason it should do that. Okay. So anyway, you know, we have all of these different uh, dates. And we, we haven't really looked at them all in detail to, to see the symbols that are there. I mean, we've looked at some. But I believe that each one of these dates is significant. Okay, so um, now one thing you'll see here, this this is actually simpler. Um, so if you go to 30 verse 20, you can see this one here. Now it's April 19th, 586. Now originally I had written April 20th, and I'm not sure why, because both the biblical and Babylonian calendar yield that in the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign, in the seventh day of the first month, um, and again, this is a prophecy regarding Egypt, um, 
that that he's going to have this vision that Ezekiel has this vision. So if we go to chapter 30, uh, verse 20, and here it says it came to pass in the 11th year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword, right? So again, you're going to have uh, this prophecy regarding Egypt. Um, and, and this prophecy specifically is going to be the scattering of Egypt. And it's going to be by the king of Babylon. Okay, so it's the same topic. But in this case, it's April 19th, 586. So it's not going to be the first day of the first month. It's going to be the seventh day of the first month. Um, and it's and it's not going to be later. It's going to be in that period of time before the destruction of Jerusalem. We're going to have this prophecy. So we can see the same topic is being talked about as the other, the one that is the first day of the first month. And this one that's April 19th is, is going to be addressing some of the same things. But this is going to be Egypt um, uh, being captive to Babylon. And then it's going to say, um, where is this here? And I can't remember. So this this prophecy here, uh, I thought it was in here. Do you remember where the 40 years is mentioned, Stephen? Um, that's... 40 years for that Egypt's going to be waste. Yeah. That's in the 29. Okay, so it is in, it's in 29. Yeah. So now this is then, of course, related, right? So 40 years, let's see, I'm just finding it quickly. Yeah, so that's 29 verse 13. So that was before the other verse. Um, Right. So I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations. I will disperse them through the countries. Yet, thus saith the Lord God, at the end of 40 years, I will gather the Egyptians from the people whither they were scattered. Now, you spend a bit of time looking at this prophecy. Can you explain it to us? Well, a lot of people just see it as symbolic. A lot of the commentators, they say it never happened. Yeah, I know. But what do we <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so do there is some people who maybe put a more like a metaphorical aspect to it. It's relating to like Gerhard Gertou. Yeah. So it's put some uh, spiritual, something to do with worship for 40 years. There was a, an Egyptian pharaoh that came in who didn't want to worship in the sense that the worship was kind of like scattered for 40 years. Um, my thinking was, is... That's what uh, I'm interested in, is your thinking. Yeah, so <laughs> in verse 12, oh no, sorry, verse 10, there you have from the Tower of Sarim even to the border of Ethiopia. Okay. So that's basically like saying from Dan to Beersheba that we have and in the, in the, referred to in, in Israel. Okay. It's basically saying from the, the north to the south of the whole country. Yeah. Going to be made desolate, um, and following this here, you have that prophecy with Nebuchadnezzar uh, is going to be given Egypt for the wages of his army. So, yeah. so like following that, so I'm sort of thinking this is forty years could be maybe related to Nebuchadnezzar, and this here word tar in the actual uh, Hebrew. I think it is, it means Migdol. Migdol, yeah. <clears throat> so in 601, like, so Nebuchadnezzar is king, like, a few years. Yeah. And uh, there's actually the Battle of Migdol, where okay. he doesn't, it's not like a decisive battle, but that's his first attempt to attack Egypt since he was king. Yeah. So this is his first foray into Egypt. And, um, so that's, so, that's, so that's about six years after Daniel's captivity. Yes. Okay. So and then 40 years is going to end? Yeah, um, so 
he dies then 40 years later. Yeah. Uh, probably six, 561. Yeah, he dies in um, 561. Yeah. yeah, so my thinking is you have there a period of 40 years where Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he's not all at their time going into Egypt. But from when that prophecy was given in 570, uh, he then goes in. Uh, there's a, there's like documents they found, tablets and some evidence, I think some still that they found in Egypt that documents uh, that Nebuchadnezzar did go in to Egypt in around the year 567. And my thinking is there that that's when he went in and basically he received the wages for his army who fought against Tyre. And they're going to go as far south as Sarain. They're going to... Okay. Uh, but they don't actually take... Uh, Egypt is not totally desolate. No, but they often use that language. I mean, the same thing with the 70 years of Jerusalem. Is it true that Jerusalem is desolate for 70 years? Uh, no, it's not. No, right. So, so we know that that this is is a symbol of a period of time. So, mm -hmm. so, so, and, and again, so I think this is the best explanation I've heard of the forty years. And and of course, it's mentioned in in verse eleven and verse thirteen, the forty years. Um, so the end of the forty years that you're saying is marked with the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that makes the most sense. Okay, so uh, I mean, we're and, looking and at the, a lot of different things here, but okay, go on. Yeah, so Egypt really loses its, it maybe had a, maybe an impact on Egypt as its uh, ability to be a major force, major yes. power. Level. And so when it came, came to the time of Cambyses in 526, he then uh, goes into Egypt and becomes the pharaoh in a sense. Yeah. And, and then from then on, Egypt's never really, it's always controlled by Medo Persians or Greeks or Romans, really. Yeah. It's never really a force then on its own. Okay. Now, now that's in, in 526. And um, now some people try to connect that to the 40 years. So they try to go here to 566. And um, so the prophecy is, um, or when when does he, when would this apply? Would 556, 566 make any sense to you? I think that's where Gerhard Berto makes an application okay. for 40 years, because it is around that their time that Nebuchadnezzar's army then would go into Egypt. All right, I think it's like 560. Seven five sixty six, so yeah. there is around that time. Uh, that's that's when I would say he would go into Sain. Yeah. Now, then, what would, what would you think of the idea that there is two periods of forty years that both are correct? I know this is kind of a little bit beyond uh, what we're trying to study here, but that, that uh -huh. there is a connection between them. I mean, one could be typical of the other or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it, it's one of those mysteries that you know people have never agreed upon. Though I think your first explanation, your explanation, is the best one. Um, but what we're seeing here, the main point that we're trying to to get to here, is that these are connecting April nineteenth as a symbol to the first day of the first month as a symbol, because it's really talking about the same thing. Can can we agree on that, Stephen? That makes sense. Um, I haven't really thought much about it, but uh, I see the potential connection. Yeah. So so when we look at, you know, it came to pass in the 11th year, the first month of the seventh day of the month, you know, and it's going to be talking about um, basically this whole issue of Egypt um, and, and Babylon that's that's already talked about in the previous chapter that's attached to the first day of the first month symbol. And this being April 19th. To me, it's evidence that we can take these numbers as symbols and marry them together, that we can marry April 19th with the first day of the first month in Ezekiel and in our lines. Right. In in how we have uh, looked at this line, uh, we can see that. Um, 
that we've done this in Millerite history, right? So we've we've connected, and I'm just trying to find this again. So I'm just looking at the year. So that was the 27th year. Uh, yeah. was the other date, and this is the 11th year. So the, that's like that's 16 years later. Yeah. 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 16 um, years. Yeah. Also, okay. Just just. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, and I've tried to figure out some of the symbols of these years and so forth. But anyway, so this is the first day of the first month. So we have Ezekiel 29, verse 17, which is going to give us the first day of the first month symbol. And Ezekiel 30, verse 20, that's going to give us the April 19th symbol. Right. And these are basically dealing with the same prophecy. Okay. Now, of course, Ezekiel beginning on the fifth day of the fourth month. It, it's actually on our calendar, five years, uh, four months and five days uh, to when he has this vision on July 21st. Um, so, you know, it starts on March 16th, uh, right? That's when we're counting his captivity. That's going to be the uh, the, 12th, the the 12th, second day of the 12th month that he's taken captive, I believe, in, um, in 580, 597 B.C., so, so, you know, so there's symbols attached with this, uh, the fifth day of the fourth month and the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And of course, we know that that's the fifth day of the fourth month in 1844. So these two dates are married together. Now, um, we looked at Ezekiel chapter 40, verse one already last time. So we can see, obviously, it's October 22nd in, um, 573 BC, so that we have that October 22nd date with the 10th day of the seventh month. Remember, it's only one in 30 months that, or one in 30 years that you're going to have the 10th day of the seventh month be October 22nd on average, <clears throat> roughly, you know, it's one in 29.530587, but you, you understand what I'm saying. So it, it's not often that you're going to have that. So when you look at these coincidence of dates with the fifth day of the fourth month being July 21st and the 10th day of the seventh month being October 22nd, it's very unlikely for one of those to happen. For both of these to happen is way more unlikely. And then to have this first day of the first month and April 19th, both connected with the same prophecy, though different biblical dates, right? One's the first day of the seventh month. Um, so that we have that coincidence. And then we have the first day of the fifth month, which we looked at. So this is the first day of the month after the city of Jerusalem has been broken down that we have this prophecy against Tyre. Tyre is going to mark, mock Jerusalem. Now, we know the fifth day of the fourth month is August 15th. Now, in Ezekiel, it never mentions August 15th. But in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, when Ezekiel begins to lie on his right side, He's he's going to do this on August 15th. So on August 15th, when he goes to bed that night, on our calendar, the Julian calendar, he's going to begin lying on his right side for 40 days. And so that August 15th date occurs after the 390 days that he lies on his left side. And a simple way to recognize it is there's 365 days in a year, right? And there's 25 days between uh, July 21st and August 15th. And if you add 25 to 365, you get 390. So so if he begins lying on his left side on July 21st, you can just you can just add 365 plus 25 to get the 390. That's why he lies on his right side on August 15th. OK. Um, yeah. What about the 20th day, ninth month? Is that, if I remember right, does that line up with anything? Uh, I, know okay. have, I know it's on that line, but does it have any yeah, well, we, line up? Well, yes. Um, so the 20th day of the ninth month, you're asking, because we know that lines up in our history, because that's December 25th, 2021. And that's from Ezra chapter 10. Right. So, so yeah. So the twentieth day of the ninth month is another symbol. So we have all of these dates that are symbols, 
that, that we have applied in the Old Testament. And the, and the point that I'm making here is that when I'm looking at these symbolic dates back in 2016, I'm not matching them up with things in our history. I'm, I'm matching them with Millerite history. And, and the question that a person would have to ask is, can we do that? Now, if somebody says we can't use symbolic dates, then they have to try to explain why the dates we have in Millerite history line up with the dates in Ezekiel and how likely that is to be random. So before this study, um, and we're just going to finish with this, uh, we did some calculations, Aram and I, and roughly speaking, the chances that these dates would occur if you just had picked random dates um, in Ezekiel and you had random dates, you picked four random dates uh, in Millerite history, so you'd have the biblical date and the Julian date, the chances that this would be random is one in 500 trillion. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So, wild, right? so what somebody would have to explain is how something so unlikely uh, has occurred in Millerite history that this movement has noticed because of the unsealing of the seven thunders, because that's what this is. And, and are we going to attribute this to Satan or are we going to attribute it to Palmoni? It has to be Palmoni all the way. Yeah, because then we're going to be attributing something to God. We're going to be attributing it to Satan, right? And that would be be wrong, right? That would be blasphemy. So we have to be very careful what we do about this. We, we, I mean, we have to have an explanation for it. We could just say, well, it's just pure chance, which is so unlikely because we have so many things like this. Um, uh, because, you know, we also can add up these first days of the first month, right? 11 plus 54 plus 15 plus 107 equals 187, the number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month as an inclusive count. So the chances that that would occur randomly are extremely unlikely. So, you know, we could add that to the, to the odds and we would just multiply it, right? In this type of situation, because they're all part of the same structure. So, so God in his providence has done this. He's given it to us to understand for a reason. Now, a person might argue that we can't use it to predict dates. And that's fair enough, right? But you cannot just dismiss this as we can never use symbolic dates to understand uh, the prophecies of the Bible in the past, right? So, so we know that this use here is correct, okay? And it's illustrating the disappointment of the Millerites. And when we use dates, we ended up with a disappointment as well, which shows that we were repeating Millerite history, which means that God was leading us. So, you know, we're going to continue in these studies looking at these types of symbols. And, and we're going to come back to Ezekiel later when we get there. But we got other things to do in in the next few studies before we get back to Ezekiel. But this is what was understood, you know, in in the part in 2016. It was understood more because we're going to deal with Samuel Snow's letters and how that relates to this. So this is going to lead to understanding Samuel Snow's letters. So uh, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study, uh, the studies that we have had. Uh, this morning, and uh, we're thankful for the Sabbath and the fellowship that we can have. And I just pray for each person. I know not everybody can remember all of these dates and numbers, uh, but I pray that your Holy Spirit can impress upon their minds and hearts uh, the reality of what this represents, uh, that you have come down to earth to communicate with us through our experience as a movement and through our lives individually. And that there is a purpose in all these things. Help us to trust in you 
and to have our faith strengthened. And we pray for one another, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.